We're going to say that genes and culture are two systems of information inheritance in symmetrical relationship to human phenotypes. And both instruct or inform the phenotypes. So both of them give information that guides our behavior, that leads to, increases the frequency of certain kinds of behavior, instructs or informs. But there are key differences between them. Differences in the type of information and the means of transmission. Genes are passed along by reproduction. Culture isn't. Culture is passed along by social conveyance, again, by language, by teaching and learning, by learning from the ancestors, learning from the elders, that kind of thing. Why milk? First, it offers a terrific example of the interplay of genes and culture. It's an amazing example, as you'll see as we work our way along. It also shows why understanding people requires both of these systems of inheritance, because milk is sometimes called the perfect food. Did you ever hear that on radio or television? Sometimes it was called the perfect food, which is quite erroneous, as we'll see. The vast majority of the adult population of Homo sapiens, in fact, do not drink milk, and many of them are averse to it. Believe it or not, no one realized in Western medicine until 1965 that people, adult people, got sick by drinking milk. It wasn't until 1965. And the question that it makes me ponder is, does our society have blinders to the plight of those who are different from the mainstream? Do you know what we used for food aid in the 50s, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s? Would you believe the 90s, the 2000s? Would you believe the 2010s we're still sending food aid in the form of dry milk powder? I can still recall my first week in school. That was a time we were given free powdered milk in a government health campaign. We were encouraged to take nutritional food. And you can see the kids lining up here, the teachers pouring it out. In this case, it was warmed milk. And then, in the next slide, for some of us, it was the first time we tasted powdered milk. We had a bit of stomach trouble. <laughs> you can see the kids trundling off to the outhouse. Well, look at this list of symptoms. You can see that it's not everybody in a sample of people studied by Matthews et al. But look at the gut-related ones. There's abdominal pain, gut distension, borborygmus, flatulence, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, and vomiting, all pretty high, except maybe constipation. Why make lactose? Why has evolution favored an adult female mammary gland that puts together two monosaccharides to make a disaccharide, when in fact, to be useful at all, anywhere in the world, they have to be broken back into glucose and galactose. To be useful at all to the youngsters or to be useful at all to adult lactose absorbers, lactase is needed to break back apart lactose into glucose and galactose before it can even be absorbed into the body. If you are an infant or an adult of the LA phenotype, of the lactose absorber phenotype, you have a lot of lactase right here. Right here is where it is, in the membrane of the microvillus of the villi, of the microvillus of the brush border cells of the villi of the jejunal region of the small intestine. That's how it all happens. Otherwise, lactose is wasted, in effect, or even worse, causes those serious problems we'll talk about. So that what we realize today, associated with the phenotypic diversity between LA and LM, is genotypic diversity that human beings vary in their genetic constitutions or genotypes so that we see in some contemporary populations high frequencies of the big L allele, okay? So the challenge then of explaining this interesting case of human phenotypic diversity traces to the challenge of explaining the elevated frequency of the big L allele in certain populations. If you have one copy of big L because it's dominant, you will also be a lactose absorber because you have a gene that is responsible for persistent lactase activity into adulthood. What's interesting, little l, little l, then, is the only condition that is associated with malabsorbers. But little l, little l, is by far the most common. Please do not confuse dominance with frequency. The dominant allele, big L, is rare in the world. The little l, little l is common in all mammals. There is a subfield of evolutionary theory called population genetics, to which we will return later in the course, where in fact a change in the genetic structure of a population 
or more specifically, a change in gene frequency between generations is the definition of organic evolution. The very definition of evolutionary change is a change in gene frequency. So we have before us, we believe in the lactose case, an important evolutionary event. We have a change in the frequency of the big L gene responsible for the diversity of adult lactose absorbing phenotypes in the world. Now, we're in a very good position, thinking in the aggregate, thinking of the proportion of big L and little l in a gene pool, we're in a good position to ask, in a world that started as all little l, little l among human beings, what forces acted to increase the frequency to make more common the big L gene? Because at some point, all adults were little l, little l, and something must have operated, because we know that's a pan-mammalian condition, some adult human beings changed somehow to the big L gene and it became more common in the population. I want to emphasize that almost anything in the world can be preserved by natural selection. Almost anything can be preserved through a reproductive advantage. Cultural things, beliefs and values, the stuff we'll be studying on the B side, can cause individuals to have reproductive differences and can therefore spread as parents teach their children and parents have more kids it can spread through differential reproduction. With the advent of dairy, when cows were valued for their milk, the cultural change made milk available for adults to drink. If big L is then introduced by mutation, right, then there'd be a selective advantage to having a copy of that, to having the lactose absorbing phenotype because it would allow milk in the diet as a general food supplement, a source of calories and proteins, an additional food. So this is called the culture historical hypothesis. And look where we are. We're tracing human genetic diversity, a difference in our physiologies correlated with an underlying difference in genotypes, and we've traced it back now to cultural differences in human populations. Differences in the technology, differences in the attitudes and beliefs toward productive subsistence strategies. The culture historical hypothesis has a number of postulates which we'll run through or a number of claims. Number one, prior to animal domestication, fresh milk was generally not available for post-weaning consumption by human beings. You didn't have a source. Two, human populations at that time were characterized by high frequencies of malabsorption, as were most other mammalian populations. Three, with the advent of dairying, fresh milk did become available in many human populations for post-weaning consumption and use. So what's nice is that Simoon said a history of dairying would give you the high frequency of big L, and a history of non-dairying would leave you with the little l, little l, so now we can test, right? We can test the hypothesis, the culture historical hypothesis. Look what we found. First, we found that all non-dairying populations are lactose malabsorbers, perfectly consistent with the theory. In the absence of a selective advantage, in the absence of a reproductive advantage, you maintain high frequencies of LM and there's no elevation of the frequency of the big L allele. Cluster number one, low frequencies of lactose absorption and no history of dairy. Cluster number two also is consistent with the hypothesis. Basically, it says all populations classified as absorbing populations the entire set, without a single exception, all have a long-term cultural history of dairying. Clusters one and two tidally fit the culture historical hypothesis. Cluster three presents something of a problem. Cluster three populations, of which there are a large number, have a long cultural history of dairying, but mo none of them are lactose absorbing populations, and most of them, in fact, are below the 30 percent line, all but four of them, and are therefore malabsorbers. Uh-oh. Here are populations with that cultural change in the environment. The selection pressure presumably is there, but they didn't evolve high frequencies of big L. There seems to have been no reproductive advantage. What happened? Well, quickly, McCracken and Samoons figured out, well, obviously, there's a way around the problem. Perhaps these populations process their milk into low lactose form, obtaining the benefit of milk without the detriment of lactose. There's an ancient Greek myth who introduced cheese making before wine was known in Greece. Well, you have to accept the myth as evidence. But then there's other evidence that the process of cheese making was probably discovered accidentally by storing milk in the stomach of a ruminant, resulting in the milk being turned to curds and whey by the rennet remaining in the stomach. 
If that's true, cheese would date to the origins of milking and would go back 4,000 years. If that's true, then the result is we have a problem for Simoons. By this hypothesis, milk processing undermines the reproductive advantage of Big L and yet it evolved because the food advantage of milk would be available to everybody that knew how to process it. In science, you want to work with many hypotheses if you can and not fall in love like Simoons did with your own hypothesis. So we're back to the question, what's the survival and reproductive advantage of Big L and can we think of something other than the general food advantage of milk? It's possible that ancestral pastoralism is right but let's ask what other things might there be. It turns out that very soon after Simoons was writing, two European scientists, Flats and Rothaui, said, look, it's all about calcium. It's not the general food value. The selective advantage to the big L gene into lactose absorption is not food per se, but improved calcium supply. This is a bone with rickets, insufficiently calcified. And when you put weight on a bone like that, as a child would in a village, a child with rickets in a village in Nepal, you put weight on it and the bone just pushes out because it doesn't have the structural support. And unfortunately then the legs will harden in that position and that child will have bowed legs forever. But imagine rickets of the pelvis. A normal pelvis for a female looks like this. A big opening you can see from the top through which the child's head passes in the birth canal. If you've got rickets, it shrinks to this. A birth of a, an attempted birth of a mother with a child and the mother has rickets, uh, neither survives. In adults, the most important absorbing agent, continued Flats and Rothaui, is vitamin D. Did you know that? That the reason we're all concerned to make sure we have plenty of vitamin D is because it is an absorbing agent for calcium. You've always thought, well, plants are the only thing that photosynthesize, right? Plants are green, they photosynthesize. We off, you step outside today and you will photosynthesize vitamin D. Isn't that fun? You will photosynthesize vitamin D because it will take some of the cholesterol in your skin and convert it to vitamin D. Well, if you look at the world, where do you find ultraviolet? This just shows the ultraviolet radiation of the earth. You can see it's high on the equator and it falls off quickly. Look at that. It falls off in almost in stair steps as you go north. Where you see high numbers, there's lots of UV. Where the numbers fall off, like 50 up here in Scandinavia, we're talking about one-tenth, one-ninth, one-eighth of what we receive in this belt of land around the tropics. Lactose absorption would have a selective advantage if it can offset vitamin D deficiency. Fresh milk is not only rich in calcium, that's why it's white after all. It's got lots of calcium mineral contained in the milk but it contains four to seven percent lactose. Remember our old friend, lactose, the milk sugar, the only sugar of its kind in human food which is known to enhance the absorption of calcium in the gut just as efficiently as vitamin D. Remember we asked early on, why was it that in the evolution of the biochemistry of milk production, we took two simple monosaccharides and put them together to make a disaccharide only to turn around and break them back down again? Why did we take this elaborate biochemical apparatus and take galactose and glucose and hook them together to get lactose only to break them back down with lactase for ingestion? Here we have the glimmer of an answer. The lactose molecule has the property of stimulating calcium absorption in the gut that neither monosaccharide has. Ooh. So for an infant, milk is the perfect food because it has both the calcium and the absorbing agent. And for a lactose absorber, it gets to be a pretty exciting food because it has both the calcium that you need at high latitudes and the lactose to help with absorbing. By improving the calcium in the diet and by providing an alternative source of calcium absorbing agent, lactose absorption helped in the battle against calcium insufficiency at high latitudes. So by this hypothesis, high frequency of adult lactose absorption are expected today among peoples, A, who have a long cultural history of dairying, and B, who live at high latitudes where vitamin D deficiency is a chronic problem. Note what we've got, a prediction. A prediction that says, look, we expect to find that a reproductive differential of some magnitude existed at high latitudes, favoring lactose absorption. Why? Because milk contained both calcium and an alternative absorbing agent, an absorbing agent independent of ultraviolet radiation, a partial additional solution, which added together with depigmentation 
added with some exposure to ultraviolet radiation, but especially during winter months and other times of the year when there was insufficient vitamin D, lactose would have been a terrific benefit to the populations of the high latitudes. Several indirect measures exist using contemporary data. Look at this. Dairying effort by latitude. If people rear more cows as you go higher in latitude, that tells you that, yeah, they, they're willing to put in the effort to get to the products of dairying. Milk consumption by latitude. Is it true that if we plot the same milk consumption figures, those liters per person per year, does that go up with latitude? And my favorite, the most unexpected, cheese conversion. Conversion to cheese by latitude. How do you think that would go? Well, let's take a look. Number of cows per thousand people. So we're controlling for population size within each of we had to reduce, sad to say, down to 29 of the populations left in our sample after we got adequate data. But you can see the trend. The main trend is here. And these are milk-dependent pastoralists off the curve at zero, but with high levels of cows per 100 people. Makes perfect sense. There is a cultural emphasis on dairying as you leave 25 to 30 degrees north and south latitude and move to higher latitudes. But wait. The big L gene would only evolve to high frequency at high latitudes if cultural beliefs, that is, if your attitudes in your head are promoting milk drinking at high latitudes. Because remember, we start out little L, little L, where, you know, the stuff makes you sick, so who wants to drink that? We've got to co-evolve a supporting set of cultural beliefs to encourage milk drinking. Well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to change the cultural ideology of milk? Well, maybe there's a correlation. Today you say, but what about in history and prehistory? Any evidence from antiquity? Two fascinating clues. I'm going to let you read about this one. There's a comparison of cow genes and human lactase genes, and they both peak in diversity in the same areas. And then there's a comparison of Indo-European myths about cattle. I'm just going to zoom through these. Indo-European mythology is fascinating. And one of the things that's really interesting is so much of it came from the same source. From the same source, Indo-European populations spanned out across a broad area of northern Europe. You can see it here. Leaving us with some people in the south, some people in the Mediterranean lands, and some people way, way up above the Arctic Circle, all speaking related languages in this family, and all carrying with them a traditional body of legend of old stories about where the world came from and how it was created. We even know the pathways. We can even reconnect the history of where they were at what time from one early homeland of 5,000 years before the present time. They spread across Europe. Their languages and beliefs differentiated as they went. We know that all the languages came from a common source. The Romance, Germanic, and Slavic languages are all related. Linguists have put a time on this and that the origin was located in relatively low latitudes. Well, the punchline here is so did their myths. Their myths also originated in the same place. And even <laughs> Old Russian and some Chinese and the Prose Edda and all these Indian, Iranian, and so on mythologies are related. Now, I'm going to have to zip ahead. I was going to run you through this and show you the wonderful pictures. These are, these are myths that are very similar in their content. These are the southern versions where it involves a bull. Now we're in the Mediterranean version where it involves a she-goat and it involves a she-wolf. And as we get up to the north, are you ready for this? Here's Ymir the frost giant who lives on a giant cow and the streams of milk that flow from her udder. And he gets under the cow just like the Danish woman to drink his milk. Look at this. This is a statue in the central park of Oslo. So you put it all together and what do you find? you find that the first bovine at the beginning of time was male in the south, became a goat or a she-wolf in the Mediterranean zones, and became a giant cow in the north, that the fresh milk production was not mentioned in the south. It's mentioned and fed to the infant Zeus or Jupiter in the Mediterranean lands, and it's fed in the north to gods and giants, gigantic figures that walk the landscape drinking rivers of milk from a giant cow. Now I ask you, from the same origin, could you ask for a better demonstration that culture also adjusts to latitude? Isn't that amazing? This is not my work. I simply compiled it from the work of many other people. 
And to me, it suggests, is this accidental? It's probably guided by some kind of selective process. It's impressive, but a short list. The myth of first sacrifice in Indo-European populations appear to be historically related to a common ancestral myth, but they have differentiated in ways that highlight male bovines in lower latitudes, female bovines and their milk in higher latitudes. The high latitude variants convey the message that fresh milk is appropriate and evidently beneficial. Hey, you want your kids to be strong? Man, they could be like Thor. They could just be these giant figures with massive muscles. All you gotta do is feed them milk. Is the correlation accidental? Might it be the result of some selective process acting on culture? You can already guess that I wrote the book because I think of the second one here. In conclusion, in the case of lactose absorption, genes and culture both influence our phenotypes and they do so in ways that appear to be adaptive favoring genes and beliefs at high latitudes that enhance human survival and reproduction by encouraging fresh milk consumption and helping with calcium. It looks very much like the coevolution of genes and culture. How important is culture compared to the effect of genes? What's so interesting, my hypothesis would be that we wouldn't be capable of all the wonderful music we compose, of all the wonderful theories and mathematics we have, of all the wonderful books we can write. We wouldn't be capable of that wonderful cultural capacity if it couldn't take over and do the genes one better. If it couldn't give us better circumstances than even the genes could in specificity and detail, the recipe for chocolate chip cookies. Can't wait for that to be in your genes, right? There's almost no way for that. So my argument would be that culture is an immensely powerful adaptive capacity. It's also a powerful maladaptive capacity, and it can be used against people all over the place. Look at cigarette smoking. So you've got to keep your eye on culture. What keeps culture on track? What causes culture to get off track and run opposite to the interest of the genes? But in its potential for doing the genes one better is really amazing. You could say it as the, see it as the deputy of the genes to deliver in a quickly changing world the specificity we need to do adaptive things, but also with the potential to do very maladaptive things. Culture works both ways. Oh, it's tricky culture. That's why we speak of them as the hard sciences, right? And everybody says, yeah, and the soft sciences. No, we have the hard sciences and we have the difficult sciences. <laughs> if you follow me. It's really hard to figure out how to keep culture on track. What is it that monitors culture? How do we change it? Really tricky. We started with just this crazy little disaccharide molecule. And now we're to the level of thinking about myths and legends in Indo-European history. And it relates to some very interesting common themes about our humanity. And what I hope to be doing is giving you the tools to think about these things trying not to overwhelm you with too much detail. So a lot is in the notes and in the pictures, but trying to give you the tools to work with, to think about the diversity of us. What a fascinating subject. What could be more interesting than the diversity of human beings and the tools we need to understand that? And that's why we have Home Bio 2A and 2B. Thank you for your attention, guys. We'll continue on Monday. <laughs>